To truly understand the astonishingly true history of the unfinished obelisk, one must first wade through a quagmire of well-financed fallacy, infested with many a false prophet, incomplete or simply illogical conjecture, all of which defended by countless academic figures of institutions of influence and power, acquired via the funding in their defense of a form of mass worship of academics' perception, as if an all-knowing authority. So, with things like the obelisk, for example, one begins to wonder if this all be by design. Since academic records of this monument began, no one who has described it, predictably, has ever managed to wrap their head around how such a stone could have possibly ever been moved. Ergo, all well-funded explorers, reporters, and journalists alike, with the expectant pressure of their return with a deciphered mystery. It would appear this explanation never arose, yet was skillfully averted. Firstly, the rock had indeed been abandoned abruptly at some point in history conveniently allowing academia to make nearly all those interested in the obelisk overlook this eventual intention by its original creators, a distraction made by a fault line. Chris Dunn, an independent investigator held in varied regard, found that details of decoration were already being added to the stone as it was being hewn, running exactly through this so-called fault disproving this so-long-held academic fallacy. Yet, alas, although the unfinished obelisk lay still attached to the strata of Earth, like that of the larger of the two megaliths in Yangsham Quarry, the largest some 16,000 tons, academia is not required nor would even attempt to provide any logical explanation as to how these blocks would have been moved. Additionally, however, and perhaps most revealing, is the pregnant lady of Lebanon, a 1,000-plus ton megalith, so large that just like that of the unfinished obelisk, no attempt was ever made to explain the ancient civilization responsible could have moved such stones to their final placements. Yet, remarkably, the proverbial nail in the coffin and vindication of our claim was the excavations made around the pregnant woman recently revealing that this stone was not abandoned on a slight incline, as claimed, but was placed atop another stone of even bigger proportions, suggesting it was part of a once enormous structure and exposing this reoccurring academic strategy when it comes to dismissing the controversial. It is a reality which we find incredibly annoying. Some of the largest, and indeed oldest, megalithic sites upon Earth are mostly classified as ruins due to them indeed being in a dilapidated state. Yet upon our travels around these so-called ruins, we have often found that erosion is not the primary cause of this current state. Many of those built much later than that of the clearly naturally eroded conditions of Cappadocia where some sections have literally returned to the geologically natural state in which they were first formed, for example. Instead, they appear to have experienced a cataclysm, one possibly involving a great flood. The crack in the unfinished obelisk, unfinished, like countless other ancient sites, abruptly abandoned ancient quarries, ancient builds, structures, even Moai on Easter Island abandoned at their seeming height of abilities. These places, preserved in a state of past bustling, yet these once flourishing stonemason locations, are all now moderately damaged, with only those built to an angle and in anticipation of attack or cataclysm surviving in any real significance, a testament to the builders of these sites' abilities and insight, yet further confirmation of an unknown event once occurring the tallest and oldest of obelisks across the globe often lay toppled as if hit by a wave. Could this reinforce the argument of their indeed once being the Great Deluge? One with enough force to topple these multi-ton monuments worldwide? Menhirs are classified as Neolithic monuments, some of which, although rarely discussed, weigh sometimes over a hundred tons. 
This may indeed be part of the reason they are rarely academically explored. The most spectacular of these being the Loch Mariake megaliths, a complex of Neolithic constructions in Loch Mariake, Brittany. It comprises of the elaborate tumulus passage grave, a dolmen known as the Table des Marchands, and the most incredible of the ruins, the broken, or more accurately toppled, Menhir of Urgra, the largest single block of stone so far known to have ever been transported and erected by Neolithic people. This one rock, like the toppled obelisk of Axum, was of a gigantic size, academically claimed as being quarried and transported by people of primitive nature with Stone Age tools. It is estimated that it weighed over 330 tons when first placed. The question is, like countless other claimed Neolithic ruins, how did they achieve such feats? How did they lift such enormous stones? Were they, like we have posited many times before, the remnants of a once advanced yet destroyed ancient civilization? We find such possibilities, in particular, the men here of Ergra, highly compelling. An astonishing collection of ancient evidential items and rediscovered historical factors have allowed the argument for an once lost history to have existed, all but now a foregone conclusion. A civilization at which some point in our distant past was lost, yet a once highly advanced worldwide culture. The proof that these ruins were all built by the same people or by those who were in contact with each other worldwide is now, we feel, overwhelming. Yet their technological capabilities were just as equally astonishing. Cut from nearly every type of strata, ruins with such precision not only do they seemingly appear to have been cut with laser technologies, but the Barbara Caves is undoubtedly the jewel in the crown. When previously looked at by us, we were astonished by the finish of the cave's walls, both in surface and angle, which, thankfully, due to the structure's sheltered nature, have survived for at least 2,300 years in incredible condition. Even more astounding, however, is that this precision has recently been confirmed using modern sonar-like technology, allowing for an incredibly detailed map of each cave to be created, each cave's image made from millions of points of reference, revealing, for the first time in well over 2,000 years, just how incredible the creators of these cave systems were, a feat many now believe we could not achieve ourselves. Perfect 180 curvatures on the roofs, perfect 90-degree angles on the doorways, perfectly flat floors, and perfectly vertical walls. The creation of the caves was simply perfect. We feel it is undeniable that whoever created these caves had in their possession incredibly advanced stone-cutting technologies. Yet, how this was done and with what are questions which we find hugely intriguing. Upon perusing one of our many peer-reviewed source books, ancient infrastructures, remarkable roads, mines, walls, mounds, and stone circles compiled by William R. Corliss, containing, like his other many research books, hundreds of unexplainable, inexplicably mind-bending ancient anomalies, we stumbled across a most peculiar of ancient peculiarities that of the so-called rocking stones. There are many demonstrations of this curious practice documented at sites dated to the Pleistocene era, found among ruins attributed to a primitive people, a people whom, although often making rudimentary shelters, would incorporate into them stones often weighing many tons. Any explanation as to why, or indeed how, these stones were chosen and then often set aloft with seeming ease, predictably remains elusive. The descriptions by first explorers of these rocking rocks, according to Corliss, were in the hundreds and were documented in vast locations, yet they were mostly isolated to modern-day Britain. Quote, Most rocking stones are to be found in areas once covered by Pleistocene ice sheets, British and American journals of the 17 and 1800s 
describe scores of rocking stones, yet they are virtually absent from professional publications past the 1900s. Thus, discussions of this phenomenon have been confined to amateur archaeological circles. Corliss continues, Rocking stones are large stones, often weighing many, many tons. Yet they were somehow once perfectly balanced, with an average-sized adult human being able to push and pull the stone with ease by hand." End quote. How did they once balance such enormous stones? Intriguingly, we feel that this is a mystery that is indeed possible to unravel, as a curious individual of the modern age once secretly did exactly this. Yet, infuriatingly, his explanation as to how died with him, either as a secret or, like so many others we have researched, his work covered up shortly after his passing. Known as Coral Castle, it was a place made from multi-ton megaliths, made of ancient corals, each either set aloft many meters in the air or perfectly balanced somehow all by this lone individual, one who is known as Edward Leedskalnen. The most interesting and interactive of spectacles at Edward's self-proclaimed castle is the nine-ton rotating door, which, as the name suggests, spins on its axis, made from a coral stone weighing nine tons, yet balanced perfectly, just like the ancient rocking stones. We have also covered the other remarkable case of the gentleman from America, who could and was recorded moving enormous objects, even an entire barn, simply by rolling them on small pebbles. Yet the reason to, or as to how pre-Ice Age man made these rocking stones, remains unexplained. Yet thanks to Corliss's tireless correlations, we also know that all these rocking stones are found in locations which also contain ancient dolmens. Thus, we know that the same civilization were responsible, yet who these people once were is a question which we will continue to find highly compelling. We previously shared the mysterious, conspicuous green stone, which still rests at the center of a site of incredible intrigue. Known as Hattusa, it possesses many advanced ancient ruins, which today evade explanation. Not only does the site contain a sphinx gate, but polygonal stone building constructed with blocks of considerable size, it is still, now slowly, returning to a geological state, a process which has taken millennia. As mentioned, along with its green stone, there are some exquisite ancient relics still present at the site. For example, the Yerkapi Rampart, built to such an incredibly high standard an enigmatic tunnel which was built into its belly, one which spans an impressive 70 meters in length, is still in an incredible condition. In addition to the rampart and indeed its polygonal laid floor atop, as mentioned sphinxes are present, which although often synonymous with Egypt's Giza Plateau, are found on many ancient sites. The hieroglyphic chamber, also in a notably incredible condition, although dated with the six lines of Luwian hieroglyphs, identified as being commissioned by the great king Sapaluliama II on the right-hand wall of the chamber, which describes the invasion and successes of the king, mentioning that with the help of the gods, the king invaded several lands, including that of Tarantasa. Does not explain, however, how such incredible structures were built or indeed how such polygonal masonry came into being. A masonry technique, which must be noted, is found not just at this ancient site of Hattusa, but worldwide, making it highly likely, just like that of the other sites we have covered and indeed claimed as simply having been re-inhabited, rather than constructed by those who claim so, whom we know and can track back to with modern historical study. It is littered with megalithic polygonal blockwork, some many tons in weight. It is a site which we feel was clearly the work of a lost civilization, one whom utilized now lost techniques and technologies to construct its incredible structures. The site spans a considerable distance, containing numerous temples, castles, simple dwellings, 
and an impressive strategic layout, one which would have deterred any unwanted guests and would have stifled any attempted invasion. Who originally built Hattusa? How was the site constructed? Although claimed as the Hittites and dated to the Late Bronze Age, it is a place which we find highly compelling.